This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Welcome. Uh, the way we're going to do this is I'm going to introduce the first reader, and then each reader will introduce the next one. Um, so, Soleil David is a graduating senior. She was born and raised in the Philippines, spent time in Los Angeles until finally finding a second home in the Bay Area. Um, she's also our Story Hour intern, and we're very, very grateful for all the hard work. Thanks. Thank you, Professor. Um, I'm going to be reading from a story called Weak Moments. It's about a PhD candidate in German literature named Jeffrey, who's about to accompany his girlfriend, Claire, to get a tattoo. Um, at first, he sees this as an opportunity to support her and to hold her hand. But when they get there, she's not nervous at all. And that makes him anxious. It doesn't help that the tattoo artist, Cyrus, is this good-looking guy, and they seem to be flirting. And at this point, he, f he just feels that the place is too claustrophobic, so he needs to get out. He had no idea when they had introduced themselves, when she had found out what his name was. He wondered what else she knew about him. He sat there watching them talk, Cyrus and Claire, Claire and Cyrus, watched her as she lay face down smiling, watched him as he leaned over her, and then he stood up. I'm going to smoke, and he quickly exited. He stepped out into the daylight, the parlor's tarp awning shielding him from the sun. Not for the first time in the last three months, he reached into his pocket for the cigarettes that weren't there. The decision to quit was not premeditated. It had happened three months ago, he had wandered into the viewing room looking for a lighter, a parliament stuck in his mouth, and there she was, bent over her father's coffin. Her sisters were on either side of her, each holding onto an arm. It took him a moment to realize they were dragging her away, and she was resisting violently. Her hair was plastered around her face, her makeup smeared around her eyes, the sweat stood on her forehead. Her mouth was open in a wail, and her sisters joined her in a strange chorus of agony. The sisters finally succeeded in getting her away from the coffin, and her head tilted back, not looking at her father anymore, but heavenward, as if the ceilings would be able to hear her. He had stood still, transfixed, the cigarette dangling from his mouth, watching the tears roll down her cheeks in slow, slow motion. Those beautiful, beautiful tears. He had headed out and right there dumped all the cigarettes he had, and he sat outside and waited. When she came to see him, no hair was out of place, her makeup was fresh, and she had smiled at him as if nothing was the matter, as if nothing had happened. He told her he was quitting smoking, and she responded with a, that's great, honey, and patted him on the knee. She didn't realize it was for her. He didn't know why he didn't mention the scene he had just witnessed. He kept looking for an opportunity to bring it up, but each time was never just the right time. The next day, she had stood in the cemetery with her mom and her sisters, and the whole time she had her eyes closed, and she was whispering prayers to herself. He went back into the tattoo parlor. I forgot I quit smoking, he said, then retook his seat. Claire and the artist were still talking. Why, how, the artist was saying. It's a reference to my dad. Oh. The artist gave him a conspiratorial smile. Sounds Freudian. I'm sure your boyfriend here has pointed it out. Her dad, he started to say, but she was already there ahead of him. My father passed away three months ago of cancer. He had it three years. Silence. Then, I'm sorry. It was his master password for all his online accounts. Pardon? Howl. It was his master password. I see. It's fitting, I think. He was a bit of a rebel, unconventional. How you mean like the Allen Ginsberg poem? Yes. And then she smiled at Jeffrey. That's one reference that Jeffrey approves of. 
I can't help it, he said, if I like good literature. Claire and the artist laughed. He didn't get the joke. He squeezed her hand and she squeezed back, but the hand immediately went limp under his. She had closed her eyes and she didn't seem to notice him there at all anymore. The artist had a needle over the base of Claire's neck, his hand tracing and retracing a line. He was attacking his girlfriend's skin with what he thought was viciousness, like a child furiously coloring in a drawing book. He was intent on his work and took no notice of Jeffrey. When he saw the blood, he gripped his girlfriend's hand all the more tightly, convinced that it was going to hurt, that this was the moment when she'd shed tears. This was the moment when he'd finally be able to protect her. She was breathing evenly, as though she were asleep. Her face was calm and natural under this deliberate wounding, and her breathing accented the pace of his, and he could feel the panic well up inside him. His hand, the same hand that was supposed to reassure Claire, felt damp and clammy. That's when he heard a strange, wrenching sound. It was deep and tortured, a cry of pain that couldn't be muffled. Jeff? He realized the sound had come from him. He had let out a sob, had shut his eyes, and stood up. Claire's face swam into view, her eyes wide, and were they really worried? Silence as his heart slowed down. The tattoo artist was standing still, the needle at his side dripping blood and ink onto the bleached floor. Thank you. So Joshua Escobar is a sophomore who grew up in San Bernardino County. His love for literature sprouted when his sister would read him Aesop's fables and C.S. Lewis, stories that still leave him feeling nostalgic. His writing is propelled by, des by a desire to keep asking why. Uh, thank you, Sole. Um, I just want to thank uh, Vikram Chandra, who I had a seminar with this semester, who's uh, really helpful, as well as um, uh, another faculty, Elena Jinian, who's been also really helpful. And um, today, as you guys may know, it's Cinco de Mayo, and Cinco de Mayo is my brother David's birthday. So he's uh, celebrating. Anyways, um, the story I'm going to read is called um, Like Water, the Summer Runs Off. Um, it's about three friends who ditch school to jump off a waterfall. It's a big thing for them because they'll be graduating soon. Um, so to get to the waterfall, they have to take this sketchy overgrown trail. And at the end of the trail um, is a valley filled with dark water. And the only way to get across um, is to walk along a series of pipes that ricochet between the two cliff sides. And that's where I'll start reading from. Uh, Just watch out for the graffiti because it makes them slippery, Gabriel added, like red paint over the curb. The cliff sides were jagged mountains of dirt uh, threaded with roots. As he was trying to balance, Marcos peered over them and the graffiti that read, F Los Angeles and smoke that dank sun. To see mountain ranges form like waves, like each was its own massive daunting empire. Gabriel was making a few jokes about the striking resemblances between the swampy valley and the bathroom stalls at their high school. Other than that, the three of them were silent as they crossed over the water. It looked like some kind of ritual dance they were performing, leaning forward and back, trying to balance. The patches with graffiti were slick. The graffiti itself uh, meshed naturally into the environment of cement and trees fitting like a rash. The curvature of the letters matched the senseless scrawling pattern of the vines tangled in the rafters of the trees, the branches with leaves, more of it read, if you, at first you don't succeed, call an airstrike, and the beginner is what becomes. At the end of the pipes, they could hear the waterfall rise over the sounds of the insects. On the final cement panel, someone had sprayed an enormous phallus, veinous, veiny and ferocious like a dragon. Its gross mouth spewed like flames. They continued to proceed um, the moment Espinoza, their third friend, stepped off the pipes, looking frightened like an animal. Emerging from the valley, the three friends came out onto a rocky platform. The water that fed into the gorge was carved into it and winded. From the bedrock, bedrock they could see the rest of the human, uh, humid forest of Lantana and eucalyptus. Trenches and ravines full of brush and grasses were sprawling and sprawling over and over in each other warring for water and the sun high white beaming overhead. 
The atmosphere was thick with an oily residue and a faint brownish dust. The wilderness ran to out to the horizon. Automatically, the three of them went to the ledge. They looked at the waterfall cascading down the cliff with its loud and arrogant noise. Marco saw that it was a little um, less high than three stories. Um, the gorge at the bottom was a dreamy blue color and splashing. Immediately, Marcos felt hot and thirsty. Time to do or die, Gabriel chuckled. The waterfall gushed with all the might of cars on the freeway. I'll jump, Marco said, turning towards his two friends who ba had backed away from the ledge. He stared at Espinoza. Marcos had always felt frightened by him, jealous of his coolness and ease with the girls, who always seemed to smile at him wherever they hung out. Espinoza, who had once been fierce and cool-headed, now seemed scared and helpless. He was shaking. Marcos felt like he was getting what he always wanted from his friend, Espinoza, respect. He kicked off his sh shirt and his shoes and went to the ledge. Like a remedy, the landscape saturated with hills and trees was beautiful, was draining all the venom from Marcos's fears and doubts. He ran and jumped and felt himself rushing through the air. He plunged and was immersing down in the silent water as thousands of tiny bubbles like sprites rushed towards the surface. His muscles reactivated and his neck, he necked upward. Inside, Marcos felt like an animal roaring. He surfaced to the sound of them cheering. He held up his fist and screamed like some warrior champion, like everything was coming together. He swam to the side and pulled himself on a, stones, on a stone at the water's ledge. He climbed up a rope to where his friends were. He looked at them, they looking pathetic, realizing how great the jump had made him. Gabriel's eyes were glowing and wild and excited. Um, so Gabriel, before the feeling could die down, um, dived. Um, being, but even after he did, Marcos and Espinoza had remained quiet. You look angry, Marcos said. F*** you, Espinoza said. Gabriel was making his way back up the waterfall. And that's it. Um, the next reader is Kabir Kumar, uh, Kumar. He is a 19-year-old musician and a writer from New York City. Uh, he's also my friend, and we had the same workshop together. Uh, he is a second year English major at UC Berkeley, and some of his favorite writers are Vladimir Nabokov, uh, Haruki Murakami, and Milan Kundera. Thanks, Josh. Uh, the story is called Syncope. Syncope, noun, medical. A sudden, usually temporary loss of consciousness, generally caused by insufficient oxygen in the brain. Though it was Kane who began the conversation, it was Sun who saw her getting off the train, looming far above the arc of his vision, not so much tall as cloudy. Autumn was kind, a lounge of sunshine, snow, a washing wind for each color of the trees. New York State, blanched in blood and pearl and leaf, saw them curling back onto themselves until they fell. Sun beamed a ray, kissing cold and holding his fingers up. The East Coast. Sun rose from the bench as Kane walked over, busily fishing something out of her backpack. Then, clutching a book in her hand, she pulled Sun into an energetic embrace. Sun's face pulsed with surprise and softened. Kane took the book and stuffed it into Sun's hands. Thank you, she said, for the great read. I loved it. Well, I'm glad you enjoyed it. It's one of my favorites. How was your trip? Kane moved her hair from her face and Looked down, replying only, hey, son, you want to lie it up? He fixed his eyes on the glass chamber, which glinted menacingly in the reflection of the railing, and flicked the cruel metal serration on the flimsy plastic nozzle. Holding it out, he leaned it over the pipe and lit the ewer. The flame licked hotly at his right thumb, while his left taped the hole, tapped the hole at the bottom of the glass concavity. Facing downward, he took a deep breath and inhaled pungently into his body, keeping the distillation in his lungs until he couldn't hold it anymore. He bent forward and coughed vigorously. The smoke whispered up into ozone. Son, when'd you last get high? Kane tried to hide obvious laughter. She moved from where she was standing at the railing and patted Son on the back with a last embarrassed cough. He passed the pipe back to her. So tell me, Son regained his composure. What's wrong? Kane straightened awkwardly. This might sound strange. She drew a long, staggered breath and exhaled. A few weeks ago, I lost my way. I don't mean physically. Honestly, nothing really initiated this change. If anything, I'd been feeling really good. 
One night I went to bed warm, content, spiritually sound, and then the next day I woke up feeling this mental exhaustion as if I was just sick of everything and everyone I'd ever thought of as mine. Hmm. Sun looked out to the traffic islands, the building buoys, the taxicab sharks, the salty road feeling himself adrift. A dread all too familiar and tied up with the nebulae of smoke was creeping up to him. But you're okay, he said out loud, still looking away from Kane. You're just feeling what everyone else feels. It's easy to become lost like this. Sun could already anticipate the minute of abject terror approaching his body. A heady summation, perhaps, of all that Kane was feeling. He breathed faster, releasing air as a visible hazy stream, filling a sky that was growing smaller. Sun lifted his head up and brought it down again. The nausea that was building in his body warped the dimensions of his sight. His mind became a drop-down menu upon which all the buttons had suddenly been pressed. Pop-ups flitted past the firewall so carefully fitted into place, and his consciousness was surrounded by signs that all read, no direction. His eyes closed. Whiteness, brilliant and shining whiteness. Then the gray of floor, the tired pink of knees, where am I? Who am I? What is this? Who are you? You're beautiful. Do I know you? Are you my friend? Are we close to be f I'm on the ground. It's a little cold. September? October? Are you talking to me? I need some water. Water, 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 water. The sun is going down. Yes, my name is Sun. I was just sitting here, and I was talking, and you were talking, and I was talking. Did I miss the part where we f Sun, Kane repeated. Are you okay? Rifling through the, her bag again, she lifted out a metallic bottle, which she placed at Sun's lips. Sun shook his head and took hold of the reflective silver aluminum. He tilted it back all the way so that the water filtered down through the rubber nozzle into his mouth and drained into his stomach. His eyes were still unfocused and glazed over, and he looked past her as he gave her back the vessel. Don't worry about it. I'm fine. You fell on the ground. I, nobody has ever had that sort of reaction to weed in front of me before. You looked like you were having a f***ing seizure. Sun finally looked at Kane. It, it's happened before. I guess I haven't been keeping myself hydrated. He smiled to reassure her. Kane still looked upset. She looked concernedly at Sun, trying to coax some sort of better answer from him. Sun shifted his weight on the ground and crawled closer to Kane before beginning to speak. Well, it's like, I guess, I've been feeling the same way you have. I mean, I guess I never gave you an answer to your problem, at least not a proper one. The wind blowing through Kane's hair framed her into a sad portrait against Twilight Cyan. Sun started again. I, I like people. And I like the idea of having direction, but a lot of the time, I just can't stand it. I don't want to do it. I can't do it. I hate doing anything. If we me up, it's like after a minute of terrifying, overwhelming thought, I get 15 seconds of complete and utter dissolution of memory. His face cracked into a slight smile. I have no idea who anybody is when I'm in this state. I'm a newborn. I think it's worth a minute of fear to experience such a joy. It's like sleep. It's like a wonderful dream. It's like the only way to live. Don't think about anybody. Don't do anything. Paint your room white. Get a cat. Kane looked down at sun and then up at the sky where darkness was gathering. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm now going to introduce Leila Mansouri, who's obviously much more qualified than me. She holds an MFA in fiction from UC Irvine and is currently at a work uh, on a PhD in 19th century American literature at Berkeley. Her fiction has appeared in Santa Monica Review and was named to the Notable Stories of 2010 list by the American Short Stories. She's currently at a work on a novel about the effect the downing of um, Iran Air Flight 655 has on an Iranian American family. Leila? Thank you. Um, so, uh, the project of taking I tend to write long short stories, and so the project of taking like two pages out of one of them is a really hard one for me, and I'm not sure I, I chose well. But um, I, to, to understand this, I think you need to know uh, there's a couple siblings, um, a 15-ish year old girl and her half brother, she's learning to drive. He's taken her to a large cemetery that has roads in it in the middle of winter. Um, it also happens to be the cemetery where her father, who died in a car crash, was buried. Um, that's all you need to know. The cemetery is drab and empty this time of year. Ashley has never seen it like this, so leafless, so smoothed and muted by the snow. In her memories, it's always bright and sticky, with trees exploding in green, and rows of color of flowers and flags sprouting up parallel to the gray and white stones. 
In her memories, too, there is never this winding journey from the denser, older part to the broad, newly cleared hills where her father is buried. When she thinks about her twice a year trips with mom and Eric, um, always on May 12th, and then again just with mom on Father's Day, her mind invariably leaps straight from the iron gates to where the car stops, always under the shade of the same fur, always next to the same grave. Arnold Herman, the marker reads, 1957 to 2002, simple and square, no tacky sayings or pictures, but she likes it most because whoever this Arnold Herman was, he died younger than her father. Her dad's stone is just across the drive from Arnold Herman's in the flat section where the grave markers hung close to the earth and the grass is always crowding in at their corners. Two summers ago, when the landscapers couldn't mow because of the drought, the grass got so tall that the headstones were barely visible. The only way to tell from the road that there were graves on the hill at all was by the gentle, regular dips in the soil, which Ashley remembers the saleswoman explaining are just the ground settling over the coffins. If you ever notice this thinking yourself, just fill out a form at the front office. We'll get the crews in to fix it just as soon as we can, the woman had told them, her voice plastic and cheerful as they rode in the cemetery van from one unbought site to the next. When mom signed the papers, the woman gave them each a map with dad's grave and the road to it highlighted, but she's pretty sure hers is boxed away now, along with the stickers and puppy dog folders mom kept getting her all through middle school, even though she didn't want anything to do with them after she turned 12. She's relieved, at least, that Eric has been quiet, Eric is her half-brother, um, more or less, since his freak out, and that she's been allowed to settle unharassed into a rhythm of slow, tight turns. She's not afraid of driving. It's only the thought of freeways that bothers her, and that's not exactly surprising given what happened to Dad. But it's not yet easy. She still has to concentrate to keep the gas steady and to gauge the angle of the wheels heading into curves. And she doesn't need her half-brother making her jumpy. She's decided, though, that as long as they can go on like this, in silence, with him not pestering her or pitching fits or talking about the molecules that make farts smell, she'll keep creeping past these graves without complaining, because even though he's a morbid freak, what she needs right now more than anything is 17 more supervised hours. She has to have the hours logged and signed off on to apply for the license that will allow her, if not to take herself to school, since mom needs the car for work and she's certainly not about about to ask Eric to share, then at least to take herself to the parties full of juniors and seniors that Marta told her and Barry about before she stopped eating lunch with them altogether. The parties that the sophomores who get whispered about in a good way go to. The ones that Ryan said he'd like to see her at sometime. And she wants desperately to go to these parties, the ones that are technically open to the whole school, but because of the beer, the smoking, the parentlessness, are off limits in practice to anyone so completely a loser as to need a ride, a ride from an adult. No, she needs to go, because if she doesn't go, then nothing can happen. And sure, she's taken into account what Barry said about Ryan being only a junior and having a reputation as a skis ball at that, and how Barry thinks from the way that Marta talks about the parties, they sound awful, like gross drunken hookup fests full of people they don't even like. But Ryan's been nothing but nice to her in, in their chemistry labs, and now, during the couple weeks before winter break, giving her all those rides home. And in any case, she knows it's not that simple, but he couldn't just ask her out like Chris did with Barry, because that's not how it works with older guys, especially not when the girl in question is a sophomore that no one pays attention to, because she doesn't eat with the girls who know how to tease their ponytails to look messy and accidental, and you take 10 minutes to reapply their lipstick after lunch. No, what she needs to do is make an appearance, be seen by his friends, and then it will all start to fall into place. She'll tell him how it was such a pain in the ass to get her license, how her crazy half-brother made her drive in a graveyard, and he will say that's so and put, her ha put his hand on her leg, his warm, heavy hand, just like he did two Fridays ago as he sped across the Western Hills Viaduct. And now her hands on the rattling steering wheel and knot expands under her rib cage as she remembers that gentle pressure on her thigh, the almost imperceptible movement of his palm. She breaks too late as the narrow road twists around a man on horseback marker. Tires lock and salt, salt scud scrapes gratingly as the car slows down to walking speed. Ashley, for f**k's sake, Eric shouts, stop the car. Sorry, she mumbles. Is this a joke to you, he asks. Are you trying to kill us? His face is taut, and there's a cartoonish instability in his lips, like at any moment his teeth might start chattering or he might snarl. She forces herself to swallow down the laughter that's punching within her and says calmly, 
evenly. I was going like two miles an hour, maybe four. Thank you. So next up, we have Miles Osborne. He is an, inter an interloper from the East Coast. Miles is an avid writer and an adventurer with a deep appreciation for the humorous and the bizarre. He spends his time wandering the hills of Berkeley in search of any inspiration that might be nestled among the eucalyptus trees. Miles, you know there are mountain lions up there, right? <laughs> I am indeed aware of the mountain lion threats, but thank you for the warning. <laughs> All right, um, today I'll be reading an excerpt from a piece I wrote in Professor Chandra's workshop entitled The Gator Sanctuary. It follows an innkeeper who is middle-aged and miserable, and he feels totally trapped within the environment in which he operates. Um, in this scene, we will see a very, very aggressive and um, very, very aggressive and interesting real estate agent trying to coerce um, the protagonist to sell his estate. Since you're not budging on this deal with us fine folks at Linwood Hospitality, I got an industry tip for you, Ter. You see those windows facing the lagoon? You gotta get rid of them, or at least rip off the, the wooden slats. People hate mullions. They make you feel like you're in a cage or something, and besides, they ruin the view. People give anything for a pretty sight. I'll keep that in mind. Terry didn't bother looking up from his laptop. I don't get you, Ter. Is it a family legacy thing? You can't part with the childhood home? Believe me. If you let me take this place off your hands and get you into a condo down Miami Dade Way, you won't be thinking about where you took your first tricycle ride. Buck, I'm just not interested. Terry looked at the windows. They really did resemble cages, but they'd always been there, and they'd always looked fairly presentable, even with the black burn marks that dotted the sills where his mother used to sweep the sky for seaplanes and, and smoke Marlboro lights through the side of her oxygen mask. It's a girl then, ain't it? Nope. Terry laughed. He couldn't remember the last time he had. This time, Buck let in with an ace from his deck of platitudes. Hometown babes are the best. You got me there. But I swear, give it a week in the South Beach. The girls have <laughs> like honeydew, and the guys are all fags or Germans. Not exactly competition. <laughs> Terry grinned and bore the sting of the word fags before responding. Actually, Buck, I'm pretty sure I'm allergic to honeydew. Buck flipped through a rack of brochures listing the activities available in the fringe zone between Gainesville and the Mickey Mouse Metro. He tossed aside pamphlets for space shuttle launches and deep sea fishing trips and got loud. Damn it, Ter, how in the hell do you get off on this island? Well, if you're into history, you should check out the Muskogee Red Stick burial mounds. Terry had had enough of Buck. A bit of culture would certainly repel him. They've got this little museum on Indian baskets, too. Oh, and the gift shop is lovely. They've got those itsy bitsy license plates with people's names on them. I'm sure they'll have a buck. Ter, I didn't mean like that, Buck sighed. You talking about dot Indians or them Wawa red ones from the plains? He swatted his mouth with an open hand. Native Americans. Terry frowned. So what's inside these things? Well, the Muskogee Red Sticks believe that you had to be buried with all of your belongings if you planned on enjoying them in the afterlife. So, the powerful ones. Mind you, they were matrilineal, so authority was given to the matrons and the caregivers got buried with everything, clothes, furniture, calfskin dolls representing loved ones. Terry paused, thinking of Brian and watching emeralds tumble into the refresh lozenge of his email. There was no sign of him. What was I saying? Oh, yeah. That way, even after they died, they could still enjoy life the way they did back when they were alive. Sounds awfully stupid to me. Why would anyone hang on to all that <laughs> Heaven's all about living it up better than down here. Nope, I'll pass on the Wawa mounds. It'd be a good selling point, though. People who stay at Linwood properties are into history and like that. Terry groaned. Buck, I'll tell you flat. I see what you're after, and yes, there are places I'd rather be, but I'm not selling. I can't. Not yet. I'll tell you this flat, Ter. If you don't sell, you can forget about them goddamn honeydews. There's a reason this place keeps getting passed over by the realtors. I'm the only person crazy enough to invest the kind of capital this place needs. New roofs, new flooring, new bathrooms. I mean, Jesus Christ, Ter, it's like you've been sitting around waiting for the Messiah to come and save your ass. I ain't no deity, but I'm the only one who's got what this place needs. Time, cash, and sanity. The dinner bell rang, summoning Terry. He marched obediently toward the knell, leaving Buck nonplussed beneath the rim of his cowboy hat. Honeydew would not be on the menu. Thank you.
Um, now I have the pleasure of introducing our next guest. And throughout the year, I've had a horrible history of mispronouncing her name time after time. Um, I uh, fondly refer to her as Tamillionaire, but now I will pronounce her name as Sherida Schreeder. Sherida Schreeder is from New York City, and this is her first year at, Fresh at Berkeley. Short fiction with Professor Chandra is the first English class she has taken in college, and it could not have gotten her off to a better start. Thank you. Thank you, Miles. Um, okay, so today I'm going to be reading an excerpt from a short story called Dynamics. Hey, Lee. Elle called out softly, a whisper against the noise Lee was making in the bathroom down the hall. Elle sat cross-legged in her sister's bedroom, her back against the wrought iron bed frame. Yeah, Lee replied. Seth is, um, uh, Seth is, Elle stuttered as she sat up straight and shook her dark red hair over her rounded cheeks and upturned nose. All her turquoise eyes could see were thin streams of morning sun that were carelessly spilling onto the polished wood floor. What? I can't hear you, Elle. Do you know where the eyeliner is? Lee, I need to, uh... Elle trailed off again. She breathed in deeply, folding her legs into her chest. What is it, Elle? I seriously can't hear you. Come here. I need to, uh... Why are you up at eight on a Sunday morning? Leah said loudly, finally drowning out her sister's noise. Elle pushed her hair away from her face and stared blankly at the open doorway in front of her imagining running, running across the long, creaky hall, down the staircase that ended with a curve, and out the door. And once there, she imagined filling her lungs with evergreen air and yelling it back out. I found the eyeliner. At the sound of Lee's voice, Elle's eyes snapped back into focus, and she slowly rose to her feet as her little sister continued to talk. Their eight-year age difference was always most apparent to Elle when 22-year-old Lee was too oblivious to be true. Anyway, I'm entering this haiku competition thing today, and I thought I had my poem all set last night, right? But when I'm going to bed, I reread it, and I'm like, well, this is terrible. So I stay up most of the night rewriting. Anyway, it was two in the morning, and I was completely ready to give up. But then I woke up at four and realized my original draft was definitely the best. So I sat, I need to tell you something, Lee, Elle interrupted, her body straight and still in the bathroom's doorway. What's up? Lee said, concern in her voice, but Elle saw her hand twitching to get back to applying eyeliner. Seth's moving back in. Her hand stopped twitching. Moving in like he's getting the house? Because if that's it, you don't have to worry. We can totally stay at my place in the city. I was here temporarily anyway, and it's much cooler than the burbs, not to mention closer to work. So don't worry about it, Elle. No, Lee. He's moving back in with me. We're getting back together. As Elle said this, she'd not look at her sister. Instead, she went back to imagining herself yelling from her front door. Elle did not picture her lips spilling obscenities or pleas. Instead, when her mouth opened, the sounds of regalia, burgundy, amaranth, and ravidian sprang to life. She snapped out of it as, once again, her sister's voice brought her back. Still, she could not look at Lee. But he cheated on you, Elle. That's why you left him, Lee said slowly. When Elle didn't respond, Lee continued, Okay, Elle, tell me, what did he say? What did he say was going to fix your sham of a, Lee, what the hell do you know about marriage? Elle glared at her sister. Lee looked like she, looked like she had been slapped. Elle, I'm just, I'm confused. You left him six months ago, and you, you knew that was the right thing to do, so why are you changing your mind all of a sudden? Why? Lee, you know what? Why doesn't matter. Just go talk to him again and tell him you reconsidered. Make this right, Elle. Lee, you can't just demand these decisions. It isn't anyone who puts my sister through as much pain as that sorry excuse for a human being did. Well, I don't see any line that can't be crossed. Why are you supporting him? I thought we talked about this. Now you can go back to college, get a degree, start over. Her yell, this time real, was twisted with bright amber. Lee stepped backward. This was not the sister she knew. Lee, you can't live for me. I'm staying with Seth, and I'm telling you this because you're my little sister, and right now, I just really need you, Elle said, a desperate plea creeping into her voice. Lee took another step back and found herself falling to panic. I'm sorry, Elle. I, I just, I can't. I need to go. Ignoring Elle's crestfallen face, Lee pushed past her, ran down the stairs, and out the door. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Um... 
So I'm introducing Emmeline uh, Sun, and she's graduating. She's a graduating senior at UC Berkeley. Uh, her parents wouldn't let her major in English, so she hid her English exploits under the guise of economics. Uh, while the prize committee thought that was just fine, her parents are still putting it under review. Thanks. Hi. So um, I won't be reading the play I wrote for the Samuel C. Irving Prize since I couldn't convincingly pull off a six role play about middle-aged white males, convincingly, <laughs> funnily, or even wittily. So um, I'll be reading you two pieces I wrote for fun instead. The first piece is titled, I bet sin would taste good if it were a flavor, sin-flavored ice cream. <coughs> what would sin taste like? It'd have a rather bitter aftertaste, but it'd be so good at first. Like chocolatey, marshmallowy, graham cracker, spicy gummy worms? Like the smoothest, creamiest foie gras, blanketed with an inky gem black layer of caviar ice cream? Yes, with a gunpowder tea sprinkling, and maybe some spicy red pepper seeds. The outside would be caramelized from the burning lakes of fire, the sulfuric fumes like the spiciest salsa verde, tempered with ruby red wisps of smoked paprika. Sin would burn the roof of the mouth and smoke down your throat, leaving an afterthought as it coursed through the esophagus, quenching in the hellish pit of your stomach. You would savor it, remember it, and loathe it for days. Would you have it again? Maybe. Um, so the second piece is titled, Food for the Soul. All people possess memories through association. For myself, encounters stay most fresh when food is present. For example, I don't think I believe in absolute truth. Is that an absolute truth? She asked archly, poised so knowingly in her gray Koinonia campus grade sweatshirt. Well, since I've qualified it with I think, it's actually subjective, isn't it? It can be later refuted, I mumbled. We were sitting upstairs of the Asian ghetto and I was trying to wax philosophical, all the while I could only think, staring at my plate of not so subtly halved and microwave $6 taquitos, that the only absolute truth was that this plate of Costco take and bake taquitos is not worth $6. Six dollars a travesty. Six dollars, the better half of a 1075 hourly wage. She smiled at me knowingly and the seconds dilated. I squirmed. Touche, you got me. Is this what you learn in Complet, the art of apologetics? Oh, Emmeline, she leaned over and patted me on the shoulder. You should really come to some of our meetings. I think you'd really enjoy the speakers. I can tell you with complete confidence that God's existence is an absolute truth, but you don't have to take my word for it. She left me, staring once more at the $6 taquitos and the bill and the dark existential quandaries tide pulling in my head. I had a bunch more religious encounters in college, all similar in location. There was the one girl who called me every night to check up on me. Oh, you're out for a midnight snack? Didn't you eat enough at dinner? Well, try to get to bed soon. You don't want to be tired for church tomorrow. There was the couple who tried the bait and hook blueberry muffin tactic. Since finals are just around the corner, we thought we'd bring you a basket of freshly baked snacks to keep you going. Oh, by the way, we're having a social this Saturday if you want to take a break from studying. I felt the hook clasped onto the roof of my mouth as I bit into my first warm mouthful of crumbly muffin. It was a constant barrage of wear peddling and service pushing, and I suppose I allowed it to happen for filial piety, for my eternal soul, for reasons even unknown to myself. All the while, I had other interests that also involved eating and drinking, if, in its difference, holy irreverence. Well then, here's the clincher. There was this one time at Starbucks, we sat leaning against the smudge window, looking out on Shattuck, and I was trying to ignore the plaid homeless man outside. He had his doleful eye on my tall soy caramel macchiato and my black wallet. We were murmuring back and forth about school, work, church. He pushed away his mocha fry. They always give you that signal, as if pushing a drink away reasonably symbolizes shoving you out of their lives, and cleared his throat. <clears> throat> You know, I was thinking, you're great, and don't get me wrong, I fully intend to come back to this relationship after college and grad school and work, but there was a barrage of beautifully colored words. College is a time for me to really get to know my origins and my creator. Could I really go through life so selfishly and easily when he cast himself out and onto the cross for me? His blood is painted over our sins. Well, I'm not one to argue with a divine being, and really there's nothing you can say when Jesus decides to one-up you in life. The fact of the matter is, he dumped me for Jesus. <laughs> Jesus was, they all vouched, the holy food and drink who could completely satisfy your hunger and thirst. Still, I was more interested in mere earthly eating, bisque, bechamel, bread, beer, bacon. I wanted to take in life through my mouth, and I suppose it's a similar experience to what they, the churchgoers, go through. That feeling of complete and wonderful satiety. For them, it's the wafer-thin bread of the Eucharist, the body of Christ. For me, it's the golden buttery braid of cheeseboard brioche. And it's not just the eating, but the process of eating as, as its own life-giving system. Watching a mound of pale dough rise and puff go through a wonderfully fragrant process that organically transforms it from nothing to something. 
from a pallid lump to a colorful loaf that, like the wafer, can bring life, but also flavor to its partakers. Why does it necessarily have to be all about the end result? What good is shoving something down your throat when you can't work for it first or understand how it comes to be packaged so prettily before you? If they thought to berate me on my emptiness, I was going to make up my lack in other ways. Sometimes I stayed home, phone turned off, to make myself a nice, safe, savory rice porridge. Other times, I invited them over for dinner parties, seven course meals, drink pairings, dessert ramekins to finish. They were not impressed, and my eternal soul was no less compromised. We're still at an impasse. While I accept their intents and respect their reasons, perhaps there's no compromise to arrive at. It's all a matter of definition. There are many words for bread and many ways to bake it, but no matter what they call it, the wafer still tastes stale to me. So I'm presenting Jenny Shea. Jenny is a third year English major and creative writing minor. She's also a workshop leader for the college writing program at the Student Learning Center. Thanks everyone for being here. Um, I'm reading from a story I wrote recently um, that's kind of a composite of a lot of thoughts about um, art, color, anatomy. Um, it's called White Space. My new drawing instructor, Robin Palinker, has synesthesia. Three is yellow, red is one, 2700 is black. If you ask her what color this or that number is, she answers immediately, nodding her black curls with a wry smile, as if you have asked for the name of her dog, and the dog's name is Buster. She draws houses in chalk pastel. The compositions of these drawings are simple, a horizon line connecting the edges of the paper, the house, a pentagon with the lights on, sitting in the midground. The houses look like sentient beings. They look like portraits of people with their eyes closed. One house has a single red door, another has three yellow windows. All her choices, Robin explains, are guided by synesthesia. I imagine what it must be like to have a color inside your head, sudden and inexplicable. Roll out a sheet of aluminum foil and tear it from the teeth on the edge of the box. Cover your palette with the sheet, crumpling the edges to keep it in place. From your tubes, dab your palette with five phthalocyanine green, cadmium red medium, ultramarine blue, raw sienna for a base. The paint hums with color as your fingers choke the neck of each tube and falls in luxuriant slugs onto the foil. Periodically, to keep the acrylic from drying out, spray the palette with water. The gesso has dried on the canvas. Dilute your raw sienna with water and gesso and, with a wide, flat brush, color the canvas. Remove the hairs that fall from your brush with the angled tip of the handle and go over the area. Create, with the arc of your arm, a lawn of color. When this first coat dries, pick up more color with your brush and darken your raw, your raw sienna. Do not use Mars Black, that killing color. If you must, kiss with the tip of your brush a complementary purple and gently wade the paint into the paint. Then, with this dark cousin of raw sienna, add value to your composition, shading the folds of that woman's skirt, the amber loops of another's hair. It is like erecting scaffolding. Trade gesso for paint, and with each pass, darken the bends at the woman's knees. Your mind, meanwhile, is sprouting flowers. You ache for red for that first stroke, violent, delicate, a scalpel across a patient's belly. Swill your brush around in the cup, staining the water a murky ochre. Select a thinner brush, a longer one, one that you can control from the elbow and not the wrist. Plunge the head of the brush into the cadmium red, though your painting structure requires you begin at the lightest end of the spectrum. For a moment, you see her, her eyebrows arched in careful reproach, and then you see only the slight bend in the canvas and the wild sprint of red under the brush, and you forget. You make dashes for purple, for blue, for strange and dangerous greens. Bodies emerge from the skin of the canvas. The streak in the foreground becomes the slender leg of a hospital cot. You change your dirty water once, twice, and keep the roll of paper towels on the table. You are not painting, you are walking on water. The first penis I ever witness belongs to a male model who discards his shirt in one swing of the arms and steps out of his pants. His nonchalance puts me at ease he stands barefoot in the center of the studio's concrete floor and assumes a position. We draw quickly, struggling to capture his, fle his fleeting body as it rearranges itself every few minutes. 
Robin advises us to rub the charcoal in loose ellipses to translate the volume of his body onto paper. The body is a cylinder, she chants. The arms are cylinders. The legs are cylinders. The neck is a cylinder. Then she potters around the room, suddenly embarrassed. It's too late now, she whispers to me, but I guess it's kind of funny, isn't it? I'm telling all these kids to draw his genitals like cylinders. I hope it doesn't make anyone uncomfortable. Thank you.